so I, have, I, I am excited to be here with you. Uh, this is the last slot for workshops at the Vietnam Tech Conference. For those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Evan Weinberg. And uh, on behalf of the uh, VDC committee, I want to welcome you here. Uh, Saigon South International School is honored to be hosting this, the ninth annual VTC in collaboration with Eunice Hanoi. Uh, my name is Evan. I'm the secondary STEM coordinator uh, here at Saigon South International School. Um, and so I've taught a bunch of very different courses over my, this is now my 19th year. Um, I've taught math, I've taught science, engineering, programming, lots of stuff. Um, that's in New York City, Hangzhou, China, and now here at Saigon South International School. Um, I love talking about computational thinking and sharing tools with, uh, with colleagues and students that uh, allow computational thinking to happen. I love modeling learning through making and coding to solve problems that matter. Um, and I wanna welcome you. Thank you so much for being part of this today. Um, just a little bit of uh, groundwork getting here. Hopefully you have been able to go to the uh, website on Whova for this workshop because there are some resources there that I'd love for you to check out. Uh, that will make it so that as I'm presenting things, you'll be able to try some things along the way, uh, do some programming yourself. I, I like to think that a lot of my work is not just trying to teach students to code, but trying to get colleagues, teachers, administrators, anyone who will listen to me, uh, uh, get everybody working on coding. And I know we have some special guests here, some who have coded a lot, some who have never coded before, um, maybe some retired engineers joining in the middle of the night. I'm happy to have you all here. So let's get, uh, let's get to it. I'm going to share my presentation uh, and we'll get started. So the first as I said, make sure that you have gone to the website and you can see, um, make sure that you have downloaded the, what I've called the companion guide so that you can uh, play along. And the other thing that might be useful for you is to make sure that uh, you also have the Swift Playground app installed as well. Um, all right, so. Let's get to it. Uh, as we move forward on this, I'll just get to this here. There are two components that I'm gonna be sharing today. Um, the order is gonna be the reverse of the title that I gave for this, uh, for this talk. Um, the talk is titled App Development with Swift Playgrounds, but I'm gonna do a little bit of an overview on Swift Playgrounds first, and then talk a bit about uh, talk a bit about how I teach app development in the context of Swift Playgrounds. Um, so moving along, if I could, again, I've been facilitating these workshops. Can I just get a thumbs up through Zoom that you can see the slide on the screen right now with uh, app development in Swift Playgrounds or throw something in the chat? Thank you, Luke. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Okay. So moving along, again, we're gonna be talking about Swift Playgrounds first. I'll share some reasons why I've actually made it my platform of choice for uh, teaching students in my class. Then I'll get some examples of uh, what app development is all about within Swift Playgrounds. Um, and uh, so we'll go, we'll go for about, probably about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Feel free to ask questions throughout using the chat. Um, I will do my best to monitor everything, make sure we're bringing people in from the waiting room as well. So uh, first thing, let's talk about Swift Playgrounds. Uh, Playgrounds is a free app um, available. Um, it's available for iPads that are running iPad OS and for Macs running Mac OS. And what's kind of nice is that they are, uh, they exchange files uh, pretty smoothly. So you can start something on an iPad pass it to a Mac, uh, do some work on the Mac, send it back to an iPad and experiment. And my students have a lot of fun with that uh, going back and forth. 
Um, and I'll, I'll get into some ways that they do that later. Uh, Swift Playgrounds for Matt came out a year ago during virtual school and it was really handy. Um, and, and we'll talk about why as we move forward. Um, and so uh, in Swift Playgrounds, when you install it, you're gonna see a whole bunch of, of really cool icons as you saw on this slide right here. Learn to code one, learn to code two. These are some really awesome activities that you can actually give to students right away. You can just get them uh, working on these things. You don't, as a teacher, have to do much teaching. Uh, the students get it, they're really well designed. They have uh, a really cool little animation um, that, that makes it so that uh, the kids are engaged as they go. You can see here, this is the character Byte. You're trying to use lines of code to collect a gem. And so uh, it, there's a lot of trial and error, especially for kids who have never coded before. Really fun, again, don't take a lot of uh, introduction, uh, getting students to understand what to do with those. Um, I wanna get you started if you haven't already on what I'm calling the name card challenge in Swift Playgrounds. Uh, the name card challenge is the first page of the Playgrounds book that I uh, showed a little bit earlier. If you look at this screen right here and you have, obviously if you have an iPad, it's gonna be hard for you to uh, take a picture of that. So let me just pop the link into the chat for that file so that you can access it um, and open it up. There we go. So this is the Playground book, which has some companion activities that you can do as we're working. Put that right into, there we go. Okay, and the chat, okay. There you go, so that will take you to this uh, playground that I'm talking about right now. Um, and here's the idea, here's the basic idea of what I'm looking for you to do. This first page in the playground is um, asking you to make your own name card for the Vietnam Tech Conference. You can see my name is in there or there is a name in there. And there's also a little spot for you to put a picture. And so what you can do, if you open that up, you can edit the text yourself, just as you can see on the screen right now, type your name in there tap on the image, which should be on there. And if you're running this on an iPad and you want to, you have your iPad there, you can just take a picture of yourself, pop it right in there, and it will show up on the right-hand side, right where the onion is. The onion is, of course, a little placeholder, nothing too uh, crazy there. So give that a shot. While you are working on that, um, talk a little bit about the ideas that are behind this. So this is exactly what I gave my students on uh, really the second day of class. The first day we did some installation of playgrounds and some getting to know you activities. And on the second day, I had my students coding. And so you can see just by looking at the code and playing with it a little bit, you can see that you have the power to change the code and what it does. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, all of the code that you see on the page right now is the code that's on the left-hand side of the screen when you are running Playgrounds. And uh, there's nothing being hidden here. This is just code that is uh, running uh, right on the iPad, right in Swift Playgrounds. This is Swift language. This is the Swift language, which uh, iPad and uh, iPad OS, iOS and Mac OS programs are usually written in. At the top here under Swift UI and Playground Support, you can see that those are some libraries that we need in order to get this code to run. And so with the code right there in front of us, uh, we can change the code, we can see what it does, and we can experiment with it and get it to do something else, change it to do what we want. Um, that circle view that you might see on the screen is, uh, in my case, the onion in yours. Maybe you've been able to add your own picture to the playground. 
Um, I used some code that was available from WWDC, which is Apple's big convention, usually at the start of the summer, where they release all of the features. And so uh, I followed one of their tutorials that was on WWD, from WWDC uh, to get some insights into how to use this. And uh, the big thing that is here is a library called Swift UI, which is how you program the way an app looks using Swift. And so it's what developers around the world are using to build their apps. And it's what my students uh, play with as they go. And so you can see here um, that Playgrounds is a really safe place to play, just like a normal playground. With the code in front of us, you can change something. You can uh, edit anything you see. Sometimes that will result in a mistake. Um, but that's OK. You can just hit undo, and it's back to normal. Um, and so students are really good at kind of seeing a piece of code, trying to figure out what it does, running it, and then changing it to do something else. So it's a great way to instantly get students involved in the coding process. Um, it's intuitive to students. I wouldn't be surprised if, if a few of you have already played with this on your, uh, on your own and changed some other things in addition to the things that I've shown you already. You can see at the bottom of the screen, you have the little, uh, the little gear icon. That gives you some different options for how the code runs. And so for my students, depending on their level, depending on the code that's running, I change those settings so that uh, they, they have a, a good idea of what the code is doing and they can change some things. Sometimes it's a good idea to hit that switch that says enable results because that makes it so that things pop up very quickly. So the next page that's in the playground uh, is called the button message challenge. Uh, and you can do this now, you can do it um, on your own later on. As before, you can see the code on the left-hand side and on the right, you can see what the code does when you run it. So very straightforward, Swift UI gives you all the capability of adding the different components of a user interface to the screen, everything. So you can put on text and labels, images, buttons, switches, all of the interactive parts of the app can be uh, put there as well as the code required to hook them together. And so you can see here, we have some code uh, with not a very funny joke. This is exactly what I gave my students. And uh, in the process, they put legitimately funny, appropriate jokes in there. And they were coding. So the students who really on, on day, day one or day two of the class were able to build some things. And that's really important. Um, and so giving students experience to play with these is really critical. Uh, great learning experience because it's hands-on. They make their own thing. They take code that I give them and make it their own. The next page of the playground looks like this. And so this is the user interface. You can see we can enter uh, different things in as the Celsius temperature. And the Fahrenheit temperature is shown below. At least it, it should be. Now, uh, I am hoping that as you watch this, uh, I have a lot of students in my class who have never programmed before. I have students who consider themselves more artistic than programmers. Uh, and, and I have students who have, that have programmed before. And so uh, I need a way into the course for all of these students. Um, everyone needs a way in. And so uh, over my time teaching students, uh, I am a middle child. I find one of my best teaching tools is, is making, uh, uh, anno being annoying in my own unique way. Um, and so some students will look at this calculation and they know that something is wrong. They know that 16 Celsius is not negative three Fahrenheit. So some of those students will know that there's something up and they will investigate what it is that's causing that to happen. I have designed students, the artistic ones who don't like the difference in how the Celsius temperature is uh, justified to the left and the Fahrenheit temperature is in the middle. And so uh, they don't like that. So the design students have kind of a design interest. How do you make it so that the text all goes together? Um, and so everyone starts asking why or how in some unique way. And I use that. Everyone knows something that can be fixed. Everyone sees something that can be fixed. And this is a great hook. And so 
All of these issues are dealt with using code. And so I have a way to get those students in. Um, another useful thing that I like to have students do uh, is to understand what the computer is actually doing when it runs these, these apps. And so um, I'll get this video. You can notice here that every time there's a change in the field for Celsius temperature, you can see some numbers pop up there in the middle. Um, and so that gets students to realize that the code there is running every single time that there's a change in that field. And so students can start wrapping their heads around uh, their idea of what, what is called event-driven code. The idea that code can run whenever some event uh, occurs. It could be a change in a text box. It could be hitting a button. It could be taking uh, your iPad and tilting it from one side to the other. So there are a lot of these events that we can use in our code. And so the more efficiently we can write our code, the faster the code will usually run. And so we can, we can also think about whether we need the code to run every single time when the text changes. Maybe it needs only to run when a submit button is pressed. And so these are some great lessons that students are able to get into, um, specifically because in Swift Playgrounds, they can see the results really easily. You can just see these things changing. And again, the students are, are really sharp uh, and they observe these things um, and they want to know, they ask why. Um, we can also make the code run more smoothly by uh, disabling results, which I showed you a little bit earlier. When you disable results, it makes it so that the code doesn't automatically update those uh, little numbers that you saw in the previous slide. It doesn't do that every single time. It just runs the code as if it was a real app. Sometimes that's required in order to get the code to do what it needs to do. Other times it just makes the code run more efficiently. Um, this, this feature, I didn't know about. I had one of my students, um, one of my, uh, one of my artsy students uh, who spends a lot of time sketching and drawing on her iPad, um, she was the one who actually found this and pointed this out to me. So we learned together with our students uh, quite a bit. Another thing that I'll bring up about this is that it's, it's activities like this that help, under, help students understand that there are many elements of app development. There are lots of ways that you can be an app developer. So uh, one student might be involved in designing the user interface. And uh, how is the user going to interact with the app and its features? Uh, how do we make it visually organized so that someone picking up uh, the, the app knows how to use it. There's also a programming element that says, how do we get the program to work the way we want it? How do we calculate a result correctly using, using Swift uh, and Swift operators? How do we use variables to do this? How can we ensure uh, that the program handles mistakes and errors? So you'll notice, uh, you may have noticed in the previous slide that uh, I entered some words in there and the code didn't crash, it just kept running. And so how do you handle that? And there is a way to do that with code. Um, and so the third page, page of the playground book has this corrected code. You'll be able to check this out yourself. Um, and so I want to bring up the fact that app development as a practice, uh, as, a, uh, as a career, is really a combination of a few things together. There is programming, there's app development, and then there's design thinking and project management. And you want students who are learning app development to be able to wrestle with all three of these areas. And so I'll, uh, I'm going to share some ways that we do that. Um, many courses start with the programming, and once we're good with the programming, then move on to other things involving uh, user interfaces, really giving students from day one the opportunity to fill all three of those roles is really critical. It's engaging and it makes it so that students um, uh, really wanna learn more. So I'm gonna make a plug for these resources. Uh, the Develop in Swift books are free. You can download them through the uh, Books app um, on uh, the Apple platform. These are excellent resources that uh, teachers can use out of the box to teach students. Um, these are the textbooks that you can share with students. There's also a teacher's guide that gives you suggestions on how to use them. Uh, and these books cover all three elements of app development that I mentioned, the, the programming, 
the uh, app design elements and also design thinking, project management. They, they handle everything and give you great things to use from the beginning. And they don't necessarily assume any experience. There are different levels for how you can engage with these materials. Uh, one thing I will say about this is that uh, the resources from Develop and Swift use um, Xcode. And so Xcode is professional level software. It is Apple's official program for developing apps and sending them to the App Store. And um, the, reason, the reason I have my students, excuse me, the reason for the first two years of my course I use exclusively Xcode was that I didn't want to baby my students. I wanted them to understand that they had the same tools available to them that professional engineers were using to build their apps. Uh, and so it is uh, in, incredibly powerful. Uh, and so I was, because I was doing things in Xcode, I was able to use all of the resources associated with uh, Xcode. And so there's something to be said for the fact that I use it with my students for a couple of years. Um, as the only teacher of this course in my school, I ended up doing all the, the tech maintenance with students to make sure this works, uh, this worked, uh, and there was a lot of it. Uh, the other challenge that kind of came out during, during virtual school um, is it's really tricky to get an understanding of what students are seeing on the screen when you're not with them. Uh, I use tools like uh, screen, screen sharing. I used a bunch of different tools to, to take a look at what students were doing uh, and actually in some cases type code directly into their computers, um, but it's really, it's really difficult. And so although Xcode is really powerful, uh, I was looking for something that might, uh, that might have made that whole process of learning a little bit easier, especially during virtual school. And that's the reason why I went for uh, Swift Playgrounds. It came out during virtual school last year at the perfect time. Um, it's, a, it's a reasonable download. It's uh, 230 megabytes or so. Um, and uh, it, the, the issues that sometimes came up were a lot easier to manage, especially because uh, it, it was much simpler. Um, and so having Swift Playgrounds as the platform for what students were doing with this was, uh, was really useful. And I had the added benefit that students would get the immediate feedback of Playgrounds, uh, which made it much easier for them um, to make progress. And so I was really happy, really happy with being able to do that. Uh, let's talk some more about how I teach app development. Uh, there are three types of activities that I usually have students complete in my class. And these usually, these three activities, imagine sort of the, the tree diagram here. So these three activities are often used to do those three elements of what I showed you before. So programming, uh, user interface design, and, and kind of design thinking. We also talk about tinkering, structure building, and design projects within all three of those. Um, and each one serves a very specific purpose uh, in my students exploring, developing their skills, and then making things making apps using code. And so I'll start by talking first about this idea of tinkering. And so tinkering takes the form of what I showed you during the name card activity. Uh, here's some code, find something you think you can change uh, and change it. And uh, if you like the change, keep it. If you don't like the change, hit undo and change something else. And so continue until you have something that you're happy with. Um, my opening activity during uh, uh, the second semester of this school year was basically giving students this code that you see in front of, in front of you right now. And uh, when it runs, you can see what the result is on the right-hand side. So you have a little red box. There's a picture in there. You have red circles that are on the screen already. And periodically, you have these blue circles that are being added to the screen. And so this is what I gave students, including to some new students that I had joining a second semester who had never coded before. Um, and so students actually had these, these uh, playgrounds on an iPad. They edited the code one step at a time, they experimented, and they were able to use the accelerometer in the iPad uh, to change this. So 
Uh, if you run this on an iPad, those circles um, all kind of fall with gravity. You can tip it left and right. And everything in the scene, um, except a little red pl uh, platform in the middle, moves. And so what was really kind of cool was that at the end of that class, uh, we shared what everybody had made. And so everybody was able to show what they were uh, able to do in their process. And uh, so I want to show you um, that spread. So you can see here, uh, this student took that one little platform and turned it into a cup. Okay, and uh, this student here made it like a snow globe. And so um, this is a mix of experienced students, experienced coders. Um, and it's actually only 11 out of my 34 students had any coding experience at the start of this class. Uh, so we have those, those 11 experienced students and the remaining 23 students who were just experimenting and playing around and, and uh, um, everyone found their own way into this activity. And so you have students asking a lot of questions. They wanna know, how do you make the circles bigger? How do you make them smaller? How can you make them appear more frequently? How do you change the size of the picture? How do you change the picture itself? How can you make things happen when the shapes are running into each other? And so this is a much richer learning experience uh, than you might have um, if you were instead teaching everything up front, giving everybody kind of, here's all the knowledge you need to know, and then having a project at the end of the unit for students to show what they've learned. Giving students a chance to tinker is a really powerful learning experience. And it's the, it's the core of what I uh, ask students to do in my class. The second piece that I have them uh, work on is what I call structured building. And so structured building involves writing code that has a specific purpose or learning target. And so this might be code that is incomplete or incorrect as scaffolding. So you can see the example on the right is the example that I showed you before in the, uh, in the playgrounds. Um, the code, uh, and you can see the calculation there for, uh, for temperature um, that was incorrect in the previous, in one of the previous slides. And so students noticed that and they, uh, this was to get them thinking about operations and calculations that you can do using variables. The code on the left was something uh, that we used when we were talking about decision-making in code, if-then statements, and nesting one if-then statement inside of another. Um, and so it, uh, it actually, this, this works incorrectly. This is in your playground book if you wanna play around with it, but it works incorrectly. And the goal was to get students to actually fix the code and make it so that it worked. Um, in both cases, uh, students need to look at the code that they've been given and uh, they figure out what isn't working. They get some familiarity with what the code looks like and through the process, learn to use Swift language to calculate, to compare. Um, and the, these are really critical computational thinking skills that students need to be able to do. And so this is my, my method of choice when I have students um, learn the computer science concepts that are core to the app development class. So these are things like variables, conditional statements, functions, loops. Um, those things that you might spend a couple of units at the beginning of a programming course learning and then later on adding on the complexity. I like to start with the complexity, let students play with uh, some of the ideas and then uh, as the need builds, they uh, are able to, uh, I'm able to swoop in with some explanations and some resources to help them learn the coding elements uh, that they, they might need help on. Um, the other structured building task that I'll share is something that I call a design sprint. Now design sprint has a very particular um, meaning in the context of agile development. Um, this is not the standard design sprint that uh, is used in the context of companies that are, that are agile. Uh, the idea that I use behind design sprints, I use the name, but the idea is trying to make a bunch of uh, quick, quick things used in code um, in a short amount of time. And um, the goal is really to start with a blank playground so students don't have 
any of the building activities that I showed you previously. They start with a blank playground and then from scratch in a short amount of time, they see what they can do to build up the code to do very specific things in a short amount of time. Uh, this is a collaborative activity, so students work in groups. I add some time pressure as well uh, for a very specific reason. I don't do this because I'm trying to evaluate who's able to get the answer in the shortest amount of time. That's not the point of this activity. Um, that, that is a very anxiety uh, inducing um, activity and that's not what we're going for here. Um, the, the big thing, um, the reason I'm trying to do this is to actually get my students to break out of their need for perfection. Um, the idea is building working code first, building code that does um, enough to satisfy the requirements of whatever they're supposed to build um, and getting rid of that perfection that some of them will feel. It bothers them when the font is not right. It bothers them when the size of the font is not what they're expecting. It bothers them when maybe they, they have an idea for something they'd like to build and this thing that they're building during their design sprint doesn't do that other task that they're excited about. Uh, it's really uh, a skill that students need to work on to build something that meets requirements and not getting distracted by other ideas. Those other ideas, I have students note them down so that later on as, as we move forward, that I can go to them and I can say, what were some of the ideas that you had as we were doing this activity? What do you want to build? Um, what interests you? And so getting those insights is really useful for me as their teacher because then I can think about what I can offer them in subsequent classes. Uh, the other reason why it's really powerful to do this is that at the end of these design sprints, students have a lot of working code that they wrote or they wrote with classmates that they can then use as kind of a, a personalized textbook with code snippets that help them do other things with code later on in projects. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's fun. It's for some students really challenging because uh, I ask them to do things in a short amount of time. I ask them to about, uh, abandon their need for things to be perfect and instead focus on getting something that meets requirements. Um, so the next thing that I'll show you is design projects. Uh, design projects are probably uh, the most fun thing, both for me and for students. Uh, these always involve creating an app, creating a app prototype or an actual app uh, that solves some problem and has a bunch of requirements associated with it. And so these combine elements of programming, app design, and design thinking, those three elements that I was talking about before. Uh, our first design project of the year was related to virtual school because uh, at the beginning of our school year this year, students came back in person and uh, I wanted with, with a little bit of distance because we came back to school in May, had about a month of school wrapped up for the summer. And so when we were back in school in August, I wanted students to think uh, about that experience of being in virtual school. We did some design thinking. Uh, we did a design thinking activity. Uh, we did what something called a design dash. Um, and if you have the companion guide downloaded for this, you'll actually find a link to the uh, PDF that I use for that design dash. It's really cool. It takes you through the design thinking process and uh, gets students to uh, put themselves in the shoes of uh, teachers, uh, students, and uh, everyone else who was experiencing virtual school. And so the goal of this design project was to come up with something that would address some issue related to uh, virtual school. Because this was the first project that students completed, uh, it was more of a, a prototyping project than a coding one. And so students used Keynote with a bunch of device frames. So making it look like you were actually creating a device, uh, creating an app running on an iPhone or an iPad. Um, and students pieced together what they thought would be solutions. And so you can see these are my requirements uh, for this project, you need to identify members of the school community, describe the problem that you identified through interviewing uh, the school, the group in the community, do some research associated with understanding that problem, and then 
um, coming up with an idea, building a prototype, and then uh, sharing that prototype with classmates and members of the community to try to get some, uh, some information about it. And uh, that ultimately got students thinking about the experience of really trying to make an app that solved these problems. And so the hope is that as you do, as we do these design projects in the context of a single problem within the classroom, that students start to realize that they could really make a difference. We had students, um, I'll show you on this slide here, uh, students took a whole bunch of different roles as they were going through this project. Um, some, uh, some groups decided to do surveys of their peers and sent, um, without my knowing, actually sent emails to the emails and surveys to the entire school in some cases, or every single faculty member asking them what it was like as a teacher uh, during virtual school. What was it like during, uh, for a student during virtual school? And so students got some data, collected some data to inform their prototype. Uh, this was a great opportunity for the artistic, for the designer students to really shine. So you can see one of our, our wonderful prototypes sketched out, um, which was our, our student, uh, I believe this was Angel, uh, who sketched out everything that needed to be in this app. And what was really kind of cool was those students that put the time into really planning and designing had an easy time putting together their, their prototype using Keynote uh, and doing a little bit of programming in Swift Playgrounds to try and emulate one component of what they proposed for this app. And so this engaged those different students in uh, a really exciting way. And they really, um, we had many of them asking, is this something that we could actually develop moving forward? And uh, I, I don't see why we can't. We haven't had it happen yet, only because uh, um, the students really wanted to develop their skills quite a bit. Um, they weren't, they have, all of that said, um, it hasn't happened yet, but the students are now to the point where they could start building uh, elements of this um, and sharing it with the community. Um, and so I wanna share this. Uh, the second design project that I gave students was with students following the tutorial that I mentioned a little, a little while ago. Uh, a tutorial from the developer's website after WWDC at the beginning of the summer. And so I watched the tutorial and I built a playground following that tutorial that I then gave to students as a model. And so students followed the tutorial. They had my code for comparison, but they were able to build uh, the sample app that was part of, uh, part of that tutorial. Um, and the design challenge was to take what they had learned in following that tutorial to build something else for themselves, build something that was relevant to them. Uh, and so build, uh, specifically, it was supposed to build a catalog of items that were relevant to, um, uh, to each student or group of students. Um, and the spread of what students were able to produce was incredible.
So in case, I'm not sure how that, uh, how well that video was going through. Thanks, Luke. Thanks for the shout out. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, if, if that wasn't showing up well in the recording, I've placed that, that link in the uh, chat. So you can check that out yourself. Um, I, want, I also want to say, so you saw a whole bunch of, of projects from, from students. Uh, this, this one that's on the screen right now is a recipe app from Ashley. Um, Ashley created this, uh, created this app. She had never coded before taking this class. And uh, she dove right in and uh, really made a, a pretty sophisticated array of recipes that indicated whether they were spicy or not, or not based on um, the setting in the, in the app. And in a subsequent project, she actually turned this into something that would be uh, like uh, you could you could save recipes within. Um, uh, you could mark certain ones as favorites. You could filter so that only the favorite recipes were shown. It was amazing how much she learned. Because of the format of this class, I was able to give, give her the space to be able to do all of that. And the other students watched her, they learned, um, and they had a really good time. Uh, so let me share um, why I use Playgrounds for app development, and then we'll have a chance to uh, open up for questions. Um, I switched to Playgrounds for app development specifically because it runs on Macs and iPads. I have students who prefer using the iPad if, if, whenever possible. And so it makes it really easy for those students to run uh, playgrounds. Xcode doesn't run on an iPad. It runs only on Macs right now. Um, everything that is inside of iOS, pretty much everything inside iOS is available. So when you have a device that has uh, accelerometers and the camera um, and uh, you know you can you can tilt from one place to another. All of those features are available within uh, playgrounds. You can do augmented reality experiments all within playgrounds, and it works really well. It's really smooth. Um, so if if there's a something that you can do within playgrounds, um, it's if, if there's something that is built into the iPad that you'd like to use, uh, it's there. It's available. Um, the instant feedback that you get when you run uh, a line of code and you get the output of the code line by line is really powerful. And that instant feedback makes it so that uh, students can be really efficient, um, really efficient with uh, understanding what their code is doing. Another thing that is common is as you're typing in Swift Playgrounds, you get a little autocomplete at the bottom of the screen that will let you select variables and functions that you programmed uh, in, in your program. And that makes it far less likely that you're going to include a typo in your code. Um, and the last thing I will say about, uh, about Playgrounds is that the students see me figuring things out as I adapt materials to work with Playgrounds. I learn with them. And there's something really, uh, really great when students understand that you are not the, the expert, you don't know everything. And so when students ask you a question that is not completely obvious in terms of the answer, uh, you sit with them and you work through and you show how a, how a professional learner, like uh, as we are as teachers, solves a problem when we don't know how to do something. It's really, really great. Um, I will mention uh, a couple of the challenges with app development with playgrounds. Um, and I say, I say limited existing curriculum. That's specifically for playgrounds. Uh, Swift, uh, for Swift playgrounds. The app development resources that are out there are focused on um, Xcode and developing apps. There are tons of things that are built by Apple that are within playgrounds that are really great, uh, really great activities. But specifically for app development, those three things that I mentioned before uh, about programming and uh, programming, interface design, and uh, design thinking, project management, those sorts of things, um, 
those are not specifically focused on using playgrounds. I have a, I have a sneaky suspicion that we're gonna see some of that happen soon. Um, Apple is always uh, building materials to try to support teachers um, and, and get more students coding. So I have a feeling that that's uh, in the pipeline that's coming uh, real soon. Uh, another thing that can be challenging is some of the Swift UI elements that I showed you. Um, they're still in the, uh, it's still a little bit of a work in progress. And so they're adding features, they're adjusting features. And so it's uh, with new versions of iOS, uh, it seems like they're, they're changing the names of things periodically. And so that can be a little bit tricky. But the third things is, thing is what, I've, what I mentioned. Uh, we're figuring this out together. Um, it's not just me, it's a number of us who are trying to use Swift UI and Swift Playgrounds for our app development classes. And so if you do go this route, you are not alone. There are uh, other people um, out there. But if you're looking for something that is packaged and ready to go that uses Swift Playgrounds um, for app development, we're not quite there yet. Um, but I think, uh, I think we'll be there real soon. So that brings us to about 45 minutes. Um, I would love to get some questions from uh, those of you who are here. Um, anything at all that uh, you'd like to know about app development with Swift Playgrounds, feel free to pop a question into the chat or uh, uh, turn on your microphone, turn on your video, whichever you're comfortable doing and ask away, go ahead. Not hear anything so far. Um, if you could, just in the chat, uh, on the scale of one to three, where three is you're an experienced programmer and one is you're brand new, what uh, what would you say you are? One, two, or three? Just throw a number in the chat, please. Okay. Thank you, Matthias. Matthias, did you have a question? You want to go? I do. Okay, hey. works. Um, so uh, I tried, I had to install um, a Playground, mm -hmm. but it worked just uh, during your lesson first for 10 minutes, uh, some App Store didn't work. Um, and it's it's a great, uh, so this experience and, and, and changing the code, that's a great idea. So I like this already. Um, the temperature converter doesn't work. So you showed in the video how it's live updating. Uh -huh. It doesn't do anything for me. So the code you provided. So can you try uh, disabling the results? Click on the gear and then do disable results and see if that changes it for you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. I see your, your response. Out of date three. Nick, what uh, if you had to? Say, what language are you familiar with? I'm glad to see that worked for you, Matthias. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Good. Nick, I'm curious about your out of date three. What, uh, what, ah, Java. Got it. Got it. Very cool. Very cool. There are elements of Swift that are picky in terms of type that uh, are similar to Java. Um, uh, there are, it's, there are elements of it that make it, um, again, pickier for beginners to get into than something like Python. Um, but what I would say about Swift in particular that's, uh, that's important is um, planning out your code in terms of what type of information you're trying to store in a variable is, pretty, is a useful exercise to go through with students, even, even beginners to just say, this is text, this is a number, this is a decimal, this is an integer. Um, it's not what I think is exciting on day one, and so I wouldn't have students on day one doing that, but that's definitely uh, something to get, it's useful to get them to think about that. Uh, another question. So you said, well, you're more or less the only um, Swift teacher at SSIS, but you have yeah. others, um, computer science teachers. And so I think they're more teach Python, for example. 
That's right. We do. We have a uh, we have a robotics course which does programming in a bunch of different a bunch of different languages because they do a whole bunch of different things. So there's some JavaScript, there's some Python, um, no Swift in that class. So the the language of choice in app development is is Swift because it's um, it's what is needed to activate the the uh, the playgrounds and really use all the sensors that are available um, and capabilities built into the devices. Um, our AP Computer Science Principles class uses, I think it's JavaScript um, and Python. So those two. So right now, Swift, the only place we're using Swift is in the app development class. All right, everybody. Well, if there aren't any other questions, feel free. Uh, I'm gonna pop my information back up there. Uh, feel free to use Twitter. Um, if you go to the SSIS website, you can, you can find my email there. Also put my contact info in the chat right here. Uh, if you have any questions that you want to uh, follow up on, feel free to let me know. And I will also take the slides that uh, I've used today and I will post those uh, within the chat on the Whova app so that you can uh, take a look. Um, download the companion materials. Be, uh, it's just a one page PDF because it has links to the uh, places to download the apps. Also, a, it has the playground um, that Matthias was, was playing with a little bit. It also has a folder in there, which I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to fill in some other things. I'm going to put some things into there that you might find interesting. So if, you, if there is something you would like to see, let me know, send me a quick note, and I will put it right in that folder. Um, aside from that, if there are no further questions, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. Uh, and uh, thank you for being part of the Vietnam Tech Conference today. It's been a lot of fun being part of a virtual conference today. Um, and uh, uh, I hope you've learned some stuff. I hope you've met some people. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing you the next possible opportunity, maybe in person, uh, maybe at VTC 2022. So thank you, everybody. Be good. Thanks. How many, how many uh, uh, classes do you have? So how many years is the, for the students to um, learn more about app development? So you start like grade eight to 12, that they have like four or five years to get experience? Sure. So right now we have, um, oh, Henry, thank you for your note. Yeah, iPads are great for doing, uh, doing, doing playgrounds. And I'll, I'll just, to, to that point, students are a lot more tolerant typing on the screen with the on-screen keyboard than I am. So uh, they actually don't have- I have an a, external one, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I also have the, the keyboard because it's, uh, I, guess, I guess, I don't know. We are old. Yeah, yeah, we're old. I'm looking at you, Dad. <laughs> no response. Hopefully, you fell asleep. <laughs> no, just, so uh, we have uh, grade nine through twelve in our intro courses: um, uh, robotics and engineering technology, AP computer science principles, and um, uh, app development. We have we definitely have grades nine through twelve in all those classes. Um, there are electives. These are elective classes. So anyone who wants to can take them without any prerequisites. Um, AP Computer Science Principles, you do need to be grade 10. Is that true? Yeah, uh, grade 10 or above. But um, we're really looking to expand our program and uh, offering this as an option. Uh, the numbers are pretty, pretty amazing. We have 109 students out of our, our high school taking computer science, which is 29%, uh, which, which is great. Um, it's a great place to be at. Of those, we have 37% girls. And so this approach of, of trying to make it a very, um, trying to make it non-threatening to get started with programming, it's, it's, it's working. And uh, we not only get them in the door where they take the classes, but they're sticking with us. So uh, that's, that's been a really great outcome. Um, my app development class is also, it, it is exactly 50-50. Uh, boy girl ratio. So that's, I'm happy with that. Um, yeah. doing, doing something right, I think. <laughs> yeah, sounds great. Thanks for sharing. Thanks a lot. Hope to see you on the street sometime soon. Yeah.
program. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. All right, everybody. Enjoy your day. Enjoy your evening. Thank you for joining us. See ya.